Howdy folks, Jambariki here. In today's video, I'm going to be ranking all 20 sequels to the films of Don Bluth, director of such movies as The Land Before Time, An American Tale, All Dogs Go to Heaven, and many more. I'd just like to say a few things before we begin. First of all, yes, most of these are going to be Land Before Time sequels, but not all of them. Secondly, Don Bluth was only involved with one of these films. He had nothing to do with the rest. Thirdly, yes, I have reviewed a couple of these films before, but that was five or six years ago. Those videos are pretty outdated now, and were made by a different Jamboreeki, so please don't expect the opinions of my old videos to match up with the ones in this one. Anyway, let the show begin! The Secret of Nim 2 Mrs. Brisby's son Timmy has been chosen by the Rats of Nim as the successor to his father Jonathan, who saved the rats from Nim, the National Institute of Mental Health, a facility that performs cruel superintelligence experiments on animals. Timmy has no idea what this even means, and his brother Martin envies him for being picked. Timmy moves to Form Valley, where the Rats of Nim are living, so that Mr. Aegis and Justin can teach the boy valuable education. A couple of years later, a teenage Timmy meets a girl called Jenny, who asks the rats to help her free her parents from Nim, but the rats refuse. Timmy Timmy also finds out that Martin has become a prisoner at Nim, so Timmy and Jenny go to Nim alone, only to find out that Martin has been made super intelligent, imprisoned all of the scientists, and has taken over the lab. This movie puts an intense amount of pressure on little Timmy, just because he has the same blood as the man who saved the rats from Nim, and hype him up as this special mouse who's destined for greatness. Yet, at the same time, the rats have a go at Timmy whenever he makes his own invention, thinks for himself, or overestimates himself. You've got to learn to listen. You always think you know better than everyone else. The movie even tries to throw in this message about teamwork, as it insists that Timmy learns to work with others, and to be more of a humble equal player, even though everyone is pressuring him to be this great saviour for everyone, and the rats of Nim themselves are refusing to team up with Jenny to rescue other rodents. These rats are frustratingly hypocritical, it's so annoying. Not once do any of the rats realise how backwards their treatment of Timmy is, and never do they apologise to Timmy for giving him these mixed messages. That's not all though, Jenny and Timmy's adventure to Nim is incredibly short. You expect it to be this grand, exciting journey through the wild, but nope. They find Jeremy the Crow working with some bug to pull off a scam, then Jeremy flies them to Nim. That's it. Oh, and the movie hints at a romance between Timmy and Jenny, but this romance is so contrived and lacking in chemistry that their confession of love just comes off as forced. I love you! Woo! I love you too! It's obvious that they're only a couple because the film thinks that every boy and girl character needs to get together by the end. Now, I don't think the twist about Martin is as dumb as people make it out to be. There was always potential to make it work. However, the movie does a really poor job of foreshadowing this twist. Martin's transformation from a jealous brother to an evil supervillain isn't shown until we get to see a flashback in the finale. And throughout the movie, we get no clues to this twist, none at all. On the plus side, Eric Idle is fantastic as the voice of evil Martin, despite it making no sense why Martin now has a British accent. Idle really sinks his teeth into playing a crazy, diabolical mouse. Your soon-to-be-zapped friends will be my willing soldiers. Quite a shock. No pun intended. You're insane! And his bonkers villain song is the only part of the movie that entertained me. Butterflies and pretty flowers, sunny skies and superpowers, silver streams and fluffy kitties, laser beams and rubber titties! Out of all 20 Don Bluth sequels, I found Secret of Nim 2 to be the most offensive to Bluth's legacy. It took the Secret of Nim, Don Bluth's atmospheric and beautiful magnum opus about a scared mother who overcame her fears to protect her children, and spawned a shallow and clunky fanfiction sequel that barely uses Mrs. Brisby, and disregards everything that made the first film so great. The Land Before Time 13, The Wisdom of Friends. Littlefoot is concerned that his mates aren't taking their parents' wisdom seriously enough, and he feels annoyed that he's the only one who appreciates their teachings. One day, the little dinosaurs meet a group of creatures called the Yellow Bellies, who are trying to get back home, so Littlefoot volunteers to teach them all about the Wisdoms, to help them survive their return to where they came from. Despite the reputation, I actually think the most Land Before Time sequels are either average or okay. But 13? Well, 13 is bad. Really bad. So strap in, folks. For starters, the movie has turned Littlefoot into a preachy mouthpiece for the movie's lesson on listening to your parents, making him less of a relatable character for kids, and more of a condescending teaching tool. Wisdoms are important, but not much fun. And I'm gonna learn them. Everyone? And if you're smart, you'll learn them too. Say what you will about the other sequels, but at least they tend to use a character's personal experience to get across their message to kids. 13 skips all sense of nuance and just has Littlefoot directly telling the audience what the lessons of the film are. 
This is made even more insulting by the fact that Littlefoot keeps spouting these same lessons again and again and again all the way through the film. As if the movie isn't confident that kids watching are smart enough to remember all of these advices. At least I gave him one wisdom. Stay in a group. Hello there, I'm Brother Littlefoot, and have you heard about the good wisdoms of my grandparents? But what makes 13 particularly terrible is the Yellow Bellies. These annoying comic relief characters can be best described as a herd of Jar Jar Binkses who have eaten too much sugar. That's the first wisdom. What is? Did I miss it? <sighs> and I was listening so hard. Huh? They're supposed to be grown adults, but they're rude, inconsiderate, and dangerously immature. The Yellow Bellies are so ridiculously stupid that literal children have to teach them how to function in the wild. They also clearly make Littlefoot's friends visibly uncomfortable and irritated, but Littlefoot insists that they need to help them. However, the Yellow Bellies obviously don't give a hoot about their own safety, so why should we care if they live or die? <laughs> The film even tries to tie these bumbling idiots into its message. You see, the movie portrays the Yellow Belly's lifestyle as a new flavour of wisdom for Littlefoot to learn. That you should sometimes rely on your feelings to make decisions and not worry too much about everything. Stop worrying about tomorrow and come on and dance! Here's the problem with that though. The Yellow Bellies aren't a community of deep spiritual gurus who have cleverly mastered the art of not overthinking. They're a bunch of hyperactive morons who are easily distracted and behave recklessly. They've only survived this long thanks to sheer luck and the ability to jump on their butts. Their main approach to everything is to follow their gut instinct, an intuition that's best suited for making creative choices or deciding your daily activities, not gambling on your life or choosing directions when you're lost. So yeah, the Yellow Bellies are bad role models for kids and I don't get why the film tries to paint them as harmless, quirky free thinkers. To me, The Land Before Time 13 is like an unintentional, exaggerated parody of straight-to-video animated sequels, and I can see exactly why devoted fans of the series call it the worst movie in the franchise. It's truly insulting stuff. Children deserve so, 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 so much better. The Land Before Time 14, Journey of the Brave. Littlefoot is very excited for his dad's annual visit to the Great Valley, but when his dad's herd arrives, his father is nowhere to be found. Littlefoot's dad's herd explains that his father helped them narrowly escape Fire Mountain's volcanic eruption, and everyone last saw Littlefoot's father back at Fire Mountain. So Littlefoot decides to adventure off to Fire Mountain to find his dad, and his friends insist that they come along on his quest, but they'll have to remember the directions to their destination and avoid sharp tooths along the way. Unfortunately, no one is willing to listen to each other, and the group split up. Now, Land Before Time 14 came out almost a decade after 13, so Universal had a long time to brainstorm things and revise the formula, but instead, Journey of the Brave is pretty much more of the same thing. I can't say that Journey of the Brave is the most formulaic out of all of the Land Before Time films. If you wanted to sum up what an average Land Before Time sequel is like, 14 would be the best example. It follows the usual template of Littlefoot and his friends trying to get from point A to point B, while avoiding predators and the adults coming to rescue the kids after learning that they're missing. Sure, all the other sequels are following this exact same formula, but they at least throw in something interesting into the mix, like a mysterious island, extreme weather, or a major dinosaur event. Journey of the Brave is just ticking off beats, and that's it. Sure, there's high stakes because Littlefoot's dad needs to be rescued, but that doesn't really pay off until the finale. The lesson of this film is supposed to be the importance of listening skills, but it's a flawed approach to teaching such a message. Sure, everyone's struggling to pay attention to what each other has to say, and they do need to learn to listen to one another better, but the tension between these friends goes beyond bad listening skills. Right from the start, Littlefoot's friends have not been taking this rescue mission seriously enough, and have mainly treated it like a fun road trip, they beg Littlefoot to let them come along on the journey, insisting that they really want to help, but seem to treat Littlefoot's dad's life being in danger very lightly, like they decide to play in a pool for a laugh, which in turn washes off the stinkweed that's meant to disguise their scent from predators, and Petrie wastes a lot of time letting a tribe of creatures worship him as a god. Watch. Yes, Littlefoot is being mean and stubborn throughout the film. He is not guilt-free. If we went on instead of stopping last night, I'd be with my dad. You wouldn't be anywhere without me. You? You're just slowing me down. You all are. But I can at least see where he's coming from because he's scared for his father's life. While Littlefoot's friends are mainly not listening because they're failing to see the urgency of the situation they're in. I want to swim. No, Sarah. 
Me too! <laughs> the only saving grace for this movie has to be Atta, a laid-back and warm-hearted Tyrannodon with a charming southern accent, who happens to be in a cave that Littlefoot gets trapped inside of at one point. She lets her maternal instincts kick in as she protects and supports an anxious Littlefoot, while losing humour and singing to give the scared little boy a sense of hope and comfort. Etta isn't just the best thing about this movie, she's also one of the best characters in the whole franchise. You know, I had a cousin who was nice like that. She put her head in the mouth of a sharp tooth just to help a friend. Of course, she's not around anymore because, well, she put her head in the mouth of a sharp tooth. <laughs> Land Before Time 14, more than anything, is very, very disappointing. Universal had so, 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 so much time to come up with something new and exciting. Like, why couldn't have this film been about a volcano's eruption being a threat to the Great Valley's walls, and how the dinosaurs have to protect their utopia from an impending natural disaster? Something that would shake up the status quo of the Great Valley, and doesn't require Littlefoot and his friends to go on the same formulaic adventure again. But Universal fell back into the safety net of doing more of the same thing all while turning Littlefoot's pals into selfish and immature friends who should know better by this point. An All Dogs Christmas Carol In the second All Dogs Go to Heaven sequel, Carface teams up with the hellish Bella Donna, in a scheme to use an evil whistle to brainwash every dog into delivering their owner's presents to Carface. Bella Donna's heavenly sister Annabelle tells Charlie and Itchy that she can't come to hell, but she can give them a magic star for support. Charlie comes up with the idea of changing Carface's mind about being evil, by using the magic star to reenact Charles Dickens' A Christmas Carol, with himself, Itchy, and Sasha playing each Christmas ghost. I have a weird relationship with this movie. It was one of my first introductions to the Christmas Carol story, and I have fond memories of watching it whenever Cartoon Network aired it for movie night. Revisiting it though, I have to say that it's a pretty bad movie, and maybe the weakest old dogs film. I don't want to dislike it because it gives me happy memories, but so much doesn't work here. An old dogs adaptation of A Christmas Carol could have possibly worked, because the series has never shied away from the tragedy of poverty and the evils of money, but what we ended up with doesn't live up to that potential. The biggest problem is that Carface is not Ebenezer Scrooge. Sure, they're both crooked and money-hungry, but Carface isn't just a cranky old rich man. He's a full-on dog murderer. Yes, Scrooge had a disregard for human life, and others suffered thanks to his greed, but Carface, he's a mobster who kills anyone that gets in his way. The film is asking us to sympathise with the past traumas of a character who killed our hero, and tried to help a devil corrupt the balance of the universe. Sorry, but that's a no from me? <laughs> Carface can look sad all he wants, but it's too late for me to forgive him or hope he redeems himself. Heck, in the film's ending, Carface confesses that he's only going to be good this Christmas. Way to completely miss the point of the book, movie. The movie should have just created a new dog character for the Scrooge role. The ghosts themselves are passable at best, each one doing their jobs fine. I did also like the idea of a ghost of Christmas future who is jazzy and colourful under his Grim Reaper robe. However, the ghost could certainly be doing more. When a ghost is haunting Carface, the other two could be looking for the whistle, something they don't try to do until it's too late. <gasps> Quick! We gotta find that whistle! This is the problem with having an impending Doom plot in a Christmas Carol adaptation. It overcomplicates things, and the ghosts end up with more than one responsibility. There are reasons why I didn't rank this film lower though. Like, it's a pretty fun musical. I was surprised how good the songs were for straight-to-video standards. Yet yeah, all of these songs come right out of nowhere, but they're catchy little numbers with a lot of life put into them. <laughs> I think it's time High time to clean up your act If you don't, you're doomed and that's a fact Take a look and you'll see the kind of dog you were born to be I also found Bella Donna to be a really entertaining villain because she's so energetically passionate about being evil and her diva confidence helps her to own the room Bella Donna! That's my name, don't wear it out so, Chucky, seems you stumbled onto my little plan, huh? Plus, I appreciated that the film didn't contrive a sob story for her anti-Christmas motives. She's the devil of dogs, she doesn't need a deep incentive to screw over puppies at Christmas. Although, she was kind of dumb for explaining the intricacies of her scheme to our heroes, and she has one of the most underwhelming villain defeats I've ever seen. <laughs> Ha <laughs> ha!
An All Dogs Christmas Carol is super nostalgic to me, but when I take off my rose tinted glasses, I can see a Bad Christmas Carol adaptation that's hindered by how it's trying to stay faithful to the bizarre All Dogs universe, with the worst animation out of all 20 Don Bluth sequels. It has its fun moments, and I get why kids would enjoy it a lot, but I can't say that it's a good film. The Land Before Time 12, The Great Day of the Flyers. The cultural dinosaur tradition of The Great Day of the Flyers is fast approaching, but Petrie is struggling to be in sync with his siblings in the air, and fears that he could ruin the sequence on the big day. Meanwhile, a micro-raptor called Guido has arrived in the Great Valley, but he has no idea who he is, so Littlefoot and friends try to help him work out his species. At the same time, Sarah's new sister, Trisha, has just hatched. Unfortunately, Sarah's dad, Topsy, and stepmom, Tria, are now giving all of their love and attention to Trisha, which makes Sarah feel left out. This movie is called The Great Day of the Flyers, but that's just one plot out of three. Each of these plots are meant to tie into the themes of fitting in and being yourself. On the one hand, Petrie's arc of coming to realise that it's okay for him to fly his own way, and Guido embracing his identity as a micro-raptor are decent examples of characters finding themselves. On the other hand, Sarah's plot barely fits in with the other two, because it's a very different scenario. She's not needing to learn to be herself, for finding out who she is, she's a victim of parental neglect, and she's only not fitting in because her parents suck. Sarah's plotline made me sad more than anything, because we're watching this little girl being ignored while she craves being part of her new family. To make things worse, this movie plays its child neglect plotline for laughs, like it's a goofy family sitcom. What happened? She was running away, <gasps> so I picked her up on my nose horn and she poked me in the eye and I fell. She was running? What a smart girl! What a big girl! Tria and Topsy never ever apologise for their silent treatment too. Heck, the film thinks that the real conflict is Sarah disliking her sister. Movie, the reason why Sarah resents Trisha is because her parents are neglecting her. The real conflict here is bad parenting. Tria and Topsy should be the ones learning a lesson. But nope, instead, the movie ends with Sarah saving a falling Trisha, and her parents finally paying attention to her. What kind of conclusion is that? That if an older sibling is being neglected by their parents, then they should show how much they're willing to protect their new baby sister or brother, and then their parents will acknowledge them? Huh? What? <gasps> okay, that right there, that was messed up. These three plot lines don't even smoothly run alongside each other either. The movie dedicates random amounts of time to each one, like we'll spend a few minutes with Sarah's family, then we'll get 15 to 20 minutes all about Guido's sleepwalking problem. Everything is very scattered and unfocused. Luckily, Guido is a fun guest character. He's sweet, friendly, and adorably nervous. I also found his imposter syndrome very relatable, but that's mainly because I suffer from that condition a lot. I think if Guido wasn't in this movie, I would have ranked it a little lower, because he kind of saves it. Actually, you may not believe this, but uh, <clears throat> I'm the only one like me I've ever seen. <gasps> Lab Before Time 12 is a hot mess. I'm struggling to even sum it up in a nutshell. So let's just move on, please. The Land Before Time 11, Invasion of the Tiny Sauruses. Everyone in the Great Valley is very excited to eat the pretty tree sweets that Littlefoot found. Unfortunately, Littlefoot accidentally knocks all the petals off the branches. Then, a bunch of tiny long necks gobble them all up, and Littlefoot lies that it was all the Tiny Sauruses' fault. Sarah's dad, who promised his girlfriend Tria the first sweet tree leaf, insists that the Tiny Sauruses should be wiped out. Littlefoot and his friends find the Tiny Sauruses' home, only to discover that they're harmless creatures living in peace. So our heroes try to defend and their new friends from the angry mob. Even for Land Before Time sequel standards, this one is pretty gimmicky. Its premise alone sounds like a made-up straight-to-video sequel spoof you'd see in a comedy sketch. I mean, look at this. Aladdin 4. Jafar may need glasses. That being said, it's nice that the film sets out to teach kids to respect and value tiny animals, because a lot of miniature creatures get an unfair bad rap. Grandpa even steps in to be the voice of reason in the debate of tiny creature rights. Let's not get carried away. These little creatures, whoever they are, have as much right to be here as we do. And they have as much right to eat the tree sweets. No! It's also cute seeing Sarah befriend the Tiny Sauruses' leader's daughter, because Sarah has found another girl to vent about her father issues with, and the two develop a cute bond founded on mutual personal problems. It's funny, though. He always gets the craziest when he thinks I'm in trouble. <sighs> Same with my dad. He got so mad when we made friends with Littlefoot. A lot of the movie is about the tension of Sarah possibly getting a new stepmom, 
Now, while I like that Tria's feminine touch brings out Sarah's dad's softer side, and that Tria genuinely wants to be Sarah's loving parent, I don't like where things end up going. Tria is nice and friendly on the surface, but she also rubs me the wrong way. I mean, Sarah is very certain that she doesn't want Tria to be her friend, but Tria is very, very pushy about changing that, and she gets kind of passive-aggressive after being rejected a second time. Look, Sarah. I have tried every way I know to be nice to you, but you've shrugged me off. Fine, I'm a big girl, I can take it. But I like your dad. I always did, and he likes me. And I think we're good for each other. And I could be good for you too. So Sarah accepts Tria's friendship more out of guilt than because she feels ready. No child should ever feel like they owe their step-parent anything, or that they're a bad person for setting boundaries. Yet this film acts like Sarah should stop being stubborn and let her guard down for Tria, regardless of how she feels or how long she needs to process her emotions. Meanwhile, Sarah's dad seems to be trying, more than usual at least, but it feels like he cares more about his budding romance with Tria than helping his daughter to understand her confusing new feelings and the overwhelming changes in her life. Look, Tria's an old friend, and she doesn't have anyone. She needs protection. And she's really nice. She... Well, she likes me. And I like her. I don't think Sarah's being a brat in this movie. She's just a scared child who, thanks to her dad's style of parenting, doesn't know how to express her sensitive side. And I really wish that the adults sympathize with that more. But the biggest point the film wants to make is that lying is bad and can escalate. This isn't a remarkable plotline for a kid's movie, it gets kind of overdone, and the movie doesn't really put any spins on this trope's baggage of cliches, but I guess it's good to teach children about the consequences of fibbing, that the more you make up and the more you hide, then the more likely things will get out of hand due to misunderstandings. I didn't like Land Before Time 11 very much. Sure, its lessons on animal rights and telling lies are fine, but its poor handling of step-family drama really adds this uncomfortable awkwardness, and I would actually consider this movie to be the franchise's official downhill point. The Land Before Time 6, The Secret of Source Rock. One evening, Littlefoot's granddad tells all the kids the story of the lone dinosaur, the legend of a brave long neck who defeated the sharp tooth all by himself, and how a rock magically formed in his honor, named Saurus Rock. The next day, the kids roleplay the lone dinosaur story together. Then suddenly, Littlefoot accidentally falls from a great height, but is rescued by a mysterious old diplodocus called Doc, who has come to visit the Great Valley. Littlefoot notices how his new savior looks a lot like the lone dinosaur, and he begins to idolize Doc like a hero. Later, Sarah's twin nieces end up playing on top of Saurus Rock, so Sarah and her friends rush to save them, only to damage Saurus Rock in the process. Suddenly, the Great Valley begins suffering from a series of misfortunes. Littlefoot blames their tampering of Saurus Rock for this string of bad luck, but his friends aren't as superstitious, so Littlefoot decides to fix Saurus Rock all by himself. This film starts off rather strong, because it's kind of interesting that dinosaur folklore exists in the Great Valley, and it's fun to speculate how much of it is real, especially when Doc passes into the area, whose striking resemblance to the lone dinosaur, brave heroism, and reserved nature, keeps us guessing about the legend's authenticity. Doc himself also happens to be one of the most charming guest characters in the franchise. A cool, laid-back Diplodocus with an endearing southern drawl and a passion for traveling the world. This valley's nice, but there are others just as nice out there somewhere. I've always done it my way. Moving on, looking for someplace a little better. Then, once the dinosaurs begin worrying about a possible curse, Doc just becomes a background character. As everyone bickers about whether curses are real and if Doc deserves to be blamed, I'd be fine with all these discussions about superstition if they were engaging, but every quarrel is very repetitive and often goes nowhere. I agree with Threehorn here. Life was good in this valley, just fine. And then he shows up and everything falls apart. That's right. Our luck has turned. It's the stranger's fault. Look, I get that this is a children's movie and the debates can't get too complex for tweens, but I do think that the filmmakers should have had a little more faith in children's intelligence. Heck, these boring arguments are a big reason why I ranked the film as low as I did. Look, I never liked the guy much, okay? And I'm not even sure I believe in this bad luck stuff. But if the grown-ups want to blame him, why not let him? Because it's not fair! The tedium doesn't stop there, though, because Sarah's nieces are perhaps some of the most annoying characters in the franchise. Yes, they're just little babies, so they don't know better. Sure, Sarah is kind of mean to them and should be nicer. However, Sarah's dad puts way too much pressure on Sarah to look after these toddlers. Every time the twins do something dangerous or stupid, 
Sarah gets all the blame and Sarah's dad never scolds the twins. Sarah parents these twins more than her dad does and as far as I remember, the twins never face any consequences or make up for their mistakes. It's really unfair and means that the twins never grow as characters. Yes, there's sort of an obligation for Sarah to be the responsible older kid, but Sarah's dad forgets that his daughter is just a child, can only do so much, and never asks to be an auntie. What's worse is that Sarah's dad never ever apologises to Sarah for putting this much pressure on her. Yes, he thanks her for doing a good job, but that is not the same as saying sorry. Luckily, we do get a pretty thrilling finale, in which Doc and Littlefoot's granddad take on two sharp tooths together. It's awesome seeing Littlefoot's father figures joining forces to protect Littlefoot from a predator. I also like that this scene helps Littlefoot realise that he doesn't need Doc as a hero, because his granddad is already a pretty great role model for him. Doc! Don't go too far! You never know when we might need... a hero! You already got a hero, kid. It's a sweet ending to the film that shows how humble Doc really is all while giving Grandad a deserving spotlight. Land Before Time 6 is kind of a letdown because it had the potential to be a very compelling movie, but it's just dinosaurs having soap drama quarrels with a shallow take on the theme of superstition. If Doc wasn't in this movie, I swear that I would have ranked it even lower. The Land Before Time 4 journey through the mists. A group of long necks have come to the Great Valley, claiming that their home has been taken over by mist and that the Great Valley could be next. While Littlefoot and his friends are playing together, one of the migrator long neck kids bumps into Littlefoot, and she says that her name is Ali. However, Ali only wants to play with Littlefoot, because she's only used to being around long necks, which really offends Sarah. Meanwhile, Littlefoot's granddad has become gravely ill. The only cure is the Night Flower, which can be found in the mist where the migrator long necks came from. So Littlefoot, his pals, and Ali journey to find the special flower. This sequel certainly has a high personal stake, because the goal is to find a medicinal flower before Littlefoot's granddad dies. But if I'm honest, I don't recall getting that into this one. It's kind of meh. The adventure features some awkward conflict between Ali and Littlefoot's friends, but this plot isn't anything interesting. It's just the same scene over and over. Littlefoot's friends offer a hand of friendship, Ali hangs her head or hides, and then Sarah gets annoyed for being rejected. That's mainly all that happens, until Ali ends up rescuing Sarah from the river, and then Ali's pressure just suddenly just stops. Thanks, Ali. You're welcome. I also wasn't a fan of the villains, a sharp beak and a belly dragger who play into the film's lesson on working with others despite physical differences. These two obviously hate each other and that's their one relationship trait, which means all they do is insult and berate one another. Their jabs and abuses towards each other aren't funny or entertaining. They either complain about not needing each other or accuse the other of biting them. It gets old very, very fast. I need you like a pain in the gut. Oh yeah, and I need you like a kick in the butt. These two are a big reason why I rank four so low. There's a few stuff to like though. For example, Littlefoot's grandma gets to sing a sweet lullaby about the beauty of life and death. She knows that her husband is dying, but she tries her best to comfort herself and her grandson. It's a tender musical number that genuinely moved me. I found it profound to hear a song like it in a kid's film. The ever widening circle, the wonderful circle. Of life. Oh, and when we finally get to the night flowers, they're very pretty, and their light contrasts really nicely against the haunting mist. These kids have come a long, long way, and they get to see the cure for Grandad blooming and glowing in the middle of a daunting haze. We found him, Grandpa. I wish that I had more to say about Land Before Time 4, but I just don't feel that strongly about it one way or another. Like I said, there's definitely things to appreciate, but it's also the one that made me the most tired and sleepy. The Land Before Time 5, The Mysterious Island. When the Great Valley's plant life is eaten up by a swarm of insects, the herd leave their utopian home to find somewhere else to live. Littlefoot and his friends are afraid that this could split them up, so the kids try to find a paradise that all the adults will approve of. 
Littlefoot and co discover a path to an island, but when said path is covered by the sea, the kids end up stuck on the island, and they have no idea how to get back to their parents. Luckily, it turns out that their old friend, Tromper the Baby Sharptooth, from Land Before Time 2, is living on this island. Tromper tries to protect his pals from his parents, all while making sure that they're fed. For a film called The Mysterious Island, there's actually nothing that mysterious about it. It's a pretty normal island with no weird secrets or hidden quirks. The only strange things about it are that the greenery tastes a bit different, and there's some smelly flowers. It's also kind of an uneventful film. I don't really remember much happening when I look back on it. All we're watching is a bunch of junior dinosaurs walking around a generic jungle island, and sometimes maybe hiding if one of Tromper's parents is nearby. All while the Great Valley adults wander around confused, never cluing in or working out where the kids could be. We're kind of just waiting for something to happen. The character's attempt at escape from the island by a log is kind of engaging, but fails very quickly. Sure, Ducky gets captured at one point, but then she falls out of the Predator's claws a minute later. Yeah, there's also another sharp tooth on the island, but they don't attack Littlefoot and friends until the finale. That's the thing, the film doesn't really get truly exciting until the finale. I don't think he can reach us. Whoa, I do not agree. A big chunk of the film's conflict comes from whether Chomper will eat Littlefoot and his friends, which means that the film is just rehashing the same plot as Land Before Time 2's, except this time, it's less interesting, because nothing else is happening, and the film is having to scrape for material to create tension. Thanks for the food, though. Sure you won't have a bite? Well, I... Littlefoot, watch out! Thankfully, number five happens to be the funniest Land Before Time movie. I mean it, I laughed so much at this one. For example, every sharp tooth in this film has subtitles, and I chuckled so hard when I first saw them on screen. <laughs> It's also funny that even Chomper seems fed up of having parents who only speak in loud, angry roars. It's great having somebody to talk to who doesn't roar back. Oh, and I love this part where Chomper is collecting greens and fruits for his friends, and his parents are genuinely disturbed by his behaviour. <laughs> I'll admit that I liked a couple of the songs too, from the catchy bop Big Big Water, which has been stuck in my head all week. Big, 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 big water. It's awfully big, 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 big water. To a lovely and heartwarming song in which Littlefoot and his friends sing about missing their parents' love. A number that gets especially emotional when Littlefoot starts singing to the night sky about memories of his deceased mother. So how do our heroes get off the island? Well, conveniently, a water dinosaur called Elise appears right out of nowhere at the end. She explains that she bumped into Littlefoot's granddad, who told Elise about the kids being lost. Yet nothing happens throughout this whole movie, and then this Elasmosaurus just dares ex machina's her way in to save the day, only to proceed to thirst after Littlefoot's granddad. <laughs> I was right taken with him, I was. If only he had flippers, we'd make quite a pair swimming about in the sea. Land Before Time 5 is one of the more boring sequels, but it's kind of saved by having a terrific sense of humour, a few memorable songs, and an awesome Sharp 2 vs Sharp 2 fight in the finale. I do wish that the island was actually mysterious, like it could have had a hidden cave maze and right at the end is a golden tree star to find, or maybe an eccentric dinosaur lives there and he's never left the island. I don't know, just something to help the film live up to its title. An American Tale, Fievel Goes West In this first sequel to An American Tale, Fievel and his family are attacked by a gang of cats who work for the evil Qatar Wall. After all the New York mice escape to the sewer, a cowboy marionette puppeteered by Qatar Wall convinces them all to move to the Wild West, claiming that's where cats and mice get along. On the train to the West, Fievel goes exploring, finds out that the cowboy mouse was just a puppet, and that Qatar Wall is planning to use the mice to build his own town for cats before eating them all as burgers. Fievel tries to tell his family the truth, but they won't listen to him. So he convinces his western hero, a dog called Wiley E. Burb, to come out of retirement and mentor Fievel's best friend Tiger. At the same time, Qatar Wall falls for Fievel's sister's singing and makes her into a big star, with help from the sharp-tongued Kitty, a struggling performer and Tiger's ex. Out of every Don Bluth sequel, Fievel Goes West is the most nostalgic one to me. I owned it on VHS and would watch it a lot growing up. It was one of my favourite films as a kid. However, 
Rewatching it as an adult, I have altogether mixed feelings on whether it's actually a good film. I mean, on an artistic level, it's full of some of the most cinematically amazing shots in a Don Bluth sequel. Just look at some of these truly creative images that try to recapture the visual flair of a classic western. The animators really went all out. However, the animation can also be, well, very, very, very annoying. <laughs> Producer Steven Spielberg wanted to pay tribute to the energy of Looney Tunes cartoons. But I can't say that it entirely pays off, because what we end up with is a movie in which characters are constantly moving, jumping, gesturing, yelling, hurting themselves, and bouncing around every microsecond. This is one busy, noisy, and frantic film. It's actually kind of strange how the film goes into a more slapsticky direction, because the first American Tale is a dark 80s movie, and is only comedic in small doses, although I can see why some kids would prefer Fievel Goes West over the more somber first movie. Now, the idea of a cat villain who acts refined and tries to be a more intelligent business strategic predator is an interesting idea on paper. Of course we will eat the mice, but only after we have exploited their labours. But I don't think it works in execution. You see, Cat Arbol doesn't actually try that hard to keep his secret from the mice. Like, he has many opportunities to kill Fievel off, but he's either uncertain if he should, and if he does send his minion after Fievel, he doesn't make sure that the job is done after. Which makes him look rather stupid when Fievel ends up stopping his whole evil plan by the end. The only reason why Katar Wall gets away with his fake nice cat act is because all the mice are very gullible in this movie. Despite being traumatized by cats for their whole lives, these mice are super quick to trust Katar Wall's band of crooks and immediately believe that our villain has 100% sincere intentions. I get that they're desperate for a better new life, but they become devoted to the cat cult overnight. I also never realised how weird and uncomfortable Fievel Goes West gets too, from a recurring gag in which Katar Wall ends up in the boobs of some random lady, to a group of Native American stereotypes that are dated even for 90 standards. Aw, oh, come on, fellas. I'm just a mangy old cat. I don't taste good without, you know, ketchup. This is one bizarre film that seems to live in its own odd world. Despite my gripes with Fievel Goes West, there's a lot of fun to be had from the colourful supporting characters. Like Kitty, a sassy cat who doesn't take crap from anyone, but loves to protect and nurture mice, the very animal that her species eats. You can be whatever you want if you just believe in yourself. Show me some grit and guts. Come on, honey. Oh, and I love how the film opens up with her breaking up with Tiger, then she later grieves over the only genuine relationship she's ever had while she faces the harsh reality of the West. Tonight, Tanya, forget you're in this two-mule cowpie hole of an olive pit town. You're with your fella at the El Perroco Club. You're on that stage, and he has a front row seat and you're singing your heart out just for him. There are things there I miss so much. I've forgotten why I left. As well as Wiley E. Burb, who goes from being a tired elderly dog that sleeps all day, to restoring his dignity as a cowboy hero, and becoming a wise mentor to the younger characters. Well, go ahead. Bow wow. Bow wow? It's more like bark, bark. I also love how the film explores how dark and scary the desert can be at night, as Fievel faces countless predators all by himself, because these scenes are the closest to resembling the original Don Blue film, and paint a vivid picture of how nightmarish the Wild West must have been for tiny mice. A lot of my enjoyment of Fievel Goes West comes from my childhood nostalgia, but as heavily flawed as it is, I can't deny that love and passion has been put into it. It's loud and obnoxious at times, but when it calms down, it can stop for a little spellbinding inspired moment, or give us a moving heart-to-heart -heart scene between Fievel and his hero. As much as the film kind of annoys me, I can't bring myself to hate it like some other Don Blue fans. One man's sunset is another man's dawn. I don't know what's out there beyond those hills, but if you ride yonder, head up, eyes steady, heart open, I think one day you'll find that you're the hero you've been looking for. So we're halfway through this video and I would just like to remind folks to consider subscribing to my channel. And if you're already subscribed, don't forget to click that notification bell. Thank you. The Land Before Time 8, The Big Freeze. Mr. Fick knows is the Great Valley teacher, an old man who claims to know everything and eagerly teaches kids about the world around them. One day, snow begins falling on the Great Valley and all the grown-ups are mad at Fick knows for not warning them. 
Meanwhile, Ducky is getting bad rest because of Spike's sleeping habits, and she has a go at Spike for this. When a group of Spike Tails arrive in the Great Valley, a Spike Tail mother offers to let Spike experience his species upbringing. Spike, who is sad that Ducky is annoyed at him and is struggling to fit in with his swimmer siblings, jumps at the chance to spend time with his own kind. When the Spike Tails announce that they're going to leave because the snow is affecting food resources, Spike decides to go along with them. Ducky ends up missing her adoptive brother and goes on an adventure to find him. So, Mr. Thicknose agrees to supervise Littlefoot and friends on a quest to catch up with Ducky. However, the children soon realise that Thicknose made up how smart he really is. The Land Before Time films all tend to have the same warm, earthy backgrounds, so I found it kind of fun to see a change of climate for once. Not only does the snow help this movie stand out visually from the other films, but we also get to see the pros and cons of winter weather. The kids can play in the snow all they want, which is cute when it's their first time experiencing it, and snow is actually a good weapon against predators in some scenes. But at the same time, snow can cause harsh blizzards and affect the greenery. The movie also does such a good job at showing how cold the snow is, that when our characters slide into a hot spring, we really feel the comfort and relief that they must be going through. This feels so good. So yeah, the snow isn't just a gimmicky aesthetic in this film, it does play a part in the storytelling. It's also interesting seeing how Spike feels about being an adoptive child, from questioning his identity, to working out his place in Ducky's family. Oh, and Ducky's mum is wonderful. She really shines as a mother in this film, because while she has her own emotions about Spike leaving, she makes it clear that it's up to Spike who he lives with. Sure, she feels sad and anxious about the change. That's her foster kid. But she puts Spike feelings first, and respects whatever he decides. Do you want to go with them, Spike? Huh? We'll understand if you do. Mm. Ducky and I just want what's best for you. The adventure in this film isn't anything special, but we do get to see two stubborn characters from different generations growing as dinosaurs. Ducky learns that holding a grudge against someone for too long can push them away, and Thick Nose comes to realise that pretending you know everything, no matter how much you want to feel special and admired, has its consequences by the end. But it's not too late for him to start educating himself. It's nice seeing a lesson that's especially for grandparents who are watching this film with their grandkids. Who would have thought, after all this time, there were more things I had to learn? I think that the only thing I didn't like about this movie is that once Spike and Ducky reunite, Ducky says that she'll never get mad at Spike again to show how she wants to avoid this happening in the future, which makes it seem like the film is saying that any kind of anger is bad, something I find to be very untrue. Ducky might have stayed angry at Spike for too long, but she had every right to express her feelings of annoyance at the start of the movie. She's allowed to get mad at her brother when he upsets her. Land Before Time 8 is kind of unpolished, and its adventure story is just the same thing as usual, but with a winter coating. However, I kind of appreciated it on my marathon of these movies, because a snowy Land Before Time sequel about a major character leaving the herd does sort of change things up a bit. The Land Before Time 9, Journey to Big Water. After heavy rain floods the Great Valley, Littlefoot's friends can't play with him because they're busy helping their families adapt to the aftermath. So Littlefoot is left to play alone, and he creates an imaginary friend to keep him entertained. While playing, he ends up meeting a water dinosaur called Mo, and they become good friends very quickly. Once Littlefoot's friends are finally free, they are shocked to learn that Littlefoot now has a new best friend from the ocean, but they agree to help Mo get back to the sea. There's actually quite a lot to appreciate and enjoy about Land Before Time 9. Sure, it's still following the typical storytelling template for these sequels, but there's actually a decent effort to shake up the formula. I mean, this may be a point A to point B adventure, but Mo can't walk on land and he has to strictly stay on the path of the river, so Littlefoot and his friends are often hindered by obstacles in Moe's way. Uh-oh, here comes the squished part! <gasps> I got him! Whee! <laughs> or the threat of an underwater predator, who is maybe the most intimidating antagonist we've had since the sharp tooth in the first Land Before Time movie. It's kind of like they're playing a video game together as they navigate Mo to safety. Mo himself is a bouncy and cute guest character. I can kind of imagine some audiences being annoyed by his boundless energy, but he's still just a kid in his learning stages. Oh, and I find the way he talks so adorable. I'm Littlefoot. Littlefoot? <laughs> no, li li Littlefoot. Yeah, yeah, Littlefoot. 
Mo's introduction to Littlefoot's social circle also injects some tension into the group dynamic. Sarah in particular holds a resentment towards Mo, but it's a jealousy that comes from an insecure fear that she's not fun enough for Littlefoot. The film handles this theme of jealousy quite maturely by helping Sarah see how pointless it all really is once she addresses her feelings. I mean, I'm fun too. I know that, Sarah. You're lots of fun. I am? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Huh. Then what was I all jealous for? Oh, and I like that this film validates the very idea of imaginary friends. When Littlefoot's friends accuse him of imagining Mo, Petrie chimes in to say that he has an imaginary friend and it's completely normal. I think it's really important to tell kids that it's okay for them to have imaginary friends because it's a healthy way for children to handle the emotion of loneliness. But one thing I cherish the most about Lamb Before Time 9 is how it helps Littlefoot and his friends overcome their fear of the ocean. You have to remember that their experiences on the mysterious island left them kind of traumatized. Uh, I hate the sea. But Mo helps Littlefoot to see that there's beauty and wonder to the sea. I really did find Journey to Big Water to be one of the more watchable Land Before Time sequels and have to credit it for bringing a unique angle to the franchise's stock formula. The Land Before Time 10, The Great Long Neck Migration. When Littlefoot and his grandparents start having the same strange dream, they believe that they should migrate to somewhere. After traveling very, very far, the three of them arrive at a large crater, where there are many other longnecks who have migrated for the same reason. But the real shocker is that Littlefoot's dad, Bron, is at the crater. Bron explains that he accidentally got divided from Littlefoot, but he's been looking for his son ever since. Now reunited, Bron and Littlefoot begin bonding, but this makes Shorty, an orphan who lives in Bron's herd, very jealous of Littlefoot. Meanwhile, Littlefoot's friends miss him, so they go on the long neck migration path to find him. I remember being very surprised to see Littlefoot's dad in this movie. I never expected the franchise to reveal him, because we're 10 movies in at this point, but lo and behold, here he is. I like that there's no disappointing twist to Bron. Like you've seen a lot of family films about long lost relatives turning up in a character's life, Bron doesn't want to use Littlefoot, has no tricks up his sleeve, doesn't have any red flags, he has genuine intentions as a loving father, and even respects Littlefoot's decision to stay with his grandparents after everything is over. Hey, who knows? One of these days I might drag my whole herd over to the Great Valley for a visit. It's so refreshing to see a film where the long lost dad is actually a good guy. Shorty gives the film a chance to explore how kids feel about a strange family turning up. You see, Shorty really loves Bron like a father and is scared that Littlefoot will take Bron away from him because he's already got intense abandonment issues and fears that he'll never have a family. Shorty is hostile towards Littlefoot at first, but Littlefoot starts to see things from Shorty's perspective and says the exact things that a kid like Shorty needs to hear right now. Shorty, you'll always be special to Bron. You've known him all your life, almost. I just met him. I was kind of hoping. I, I thought maybe we could be like, you know, like brothers. Although, you could argue that Bron should have been the one to calm things down. There's also something ethereal about this movie too. The idea of dreams inspiring every long neck to migrate to a giant crater is so strange yet fascinating. It kept me intrigued to work out why this is happening. It all later turns out to be a sun eclipse. And this celestial event is what drew all the long necks to the crater. The long necks themselves assume that this eclipse is actually the sun falling. And they all work together to keep it up. It's a very cute misunderstanding. I think the only thing I disliked about this movie is how pointless it was for Sarah, Petrie, Ducky, and Spike to join the Long Neck migration. Yes, they get to help the Long Necks fight predators in the finale, but their tagging along just feels like filler for the most part. I kind of wish that Littlefoot's friends stayed at home and had their own conflict to face, because they really need to show that they can have fun and live their lives without Littlefoot around. I've heard fans say that the Land Before Time sequels hit rock bottom once they reach the double digits, but I have to disagree, because Land Before Time 10 managed to keep my attention, break some kids' movie cliches, and adds a transcendent quality to the Land Before Time adventure formula. Oh, and some of the shots in this film are really impactful for a straight-to-video movie. Yes, 10 is rough around the edges, but you know what? It's the the only Land Before Time sequel that was actually necessary, because it explores the relationship between Littlefoot and his dad, something we've never seen before. 
The Land Before Time 2, The Great Valley Adventure. Littlefoot and his friends are bored of the Great Valley, so they go to the mysterious beyond for fun, but get stuck in a tar pool, and their parents have to rescue them. Their parents are very disappointed in them and insist that they stay in the Great Valley. The kids are fed up of their parents telling them what to do and not being treated like grown-ups. When Littlefoot and his friends spot a pair of egg nappers trying to steal one of Ducky's family's eggs, the kids venture off to rescue Ducky's sibling. Luckily, the egg rolls back to Ducky's family's nest but the kids don't see this and mistake a different egg for Ducky sibling. Once this other egg hatches, it's revealed to be a baby sharp tooth, which terrifies the kids. But Littlefoot tries to parent the baby sharp tooth and names it Chomper. While Littlefoot raises Tiny Chomper, his friends are reluctant to trust the baby sharp tooth, but they do try to be good parents to Chomper, only to learn the reality of how hard parenting really is. When I first saw this Land Before Time sequel, I don't remember enjoying it, but after watching all 13 sequels, I have to say that 2 is one of the better ones. It's very much a coming of age story about kids learning life from their parents' perspective and why their parents have been taking protecting their safety seriously. Littlefoot and his friends think that they can raise Chomper their own way, but they realize that being a guardian of a child isn't a game. <gasps> Chomper! <laughs> Chomper! Get back here! It's dangerous! I like that this film teaches kids to not only sympathize with their carers, but also shows children that parental adulthood isn't as fun and fancy-free as they think. It can come with bigger responsibilities that they're not ready for yet. When you're a child, the world is very confusing and there's lots of grown-up things you can't do, so it's important kids learn why their parents make certain decisions for them and why they shouldn't rush into adult situations. Chomper himself is very, very cute. I can't imagine how hard it must have been for the artist to make a T-Rex look adorable and innocent. But Chomper's design shows that it's totally possible. And when it helps that Rob Paulson gives Chomper the cutest voice ever, The film finds this good balance of addressing the dangers of having a sharp tooth friend and the potential awesomeness that can come with befriending a baby T-Rex. Plus, everything is made complicated by the fact that these kids are too stubborn to get their parents' help because they're naively eager to prove themselves. So Littlefoot and his friends are all Chomper has. It's what makes Chomper's friendship with Littlefoot and friends much more interesting to watch than Five's take on their relationship. A sharp tooth can never be one of us. Never! Don't say that! You know it's true. He has to go. The villains of the film, Ozzy and Strut, have really grown on me as comedic antagonists. These two brothers share this great dynamic of the posh smart sibling and the dopey cheery one. They have this pinky and the brain meets the three stooges thing going for them. When re-watching this film, I found myself laughing at them quite a lot. Strut, get up here! What? I'm aging! Spit that stuff out! Go on, spit it out! But Ozzy, I'm hungry! Spit Bit out. <laughs> Grass guzzler. No brother of mine is going to eat vegetation. There was a lot of pressure on Land Before Time 2 as the first sequel to Don Bluth's original, and while I don't think it meshes up to Don Bluth's movie by any stretch, it seems to be trying harder than most Land Before Time sequels. An American Tale, The Mystery of the Night Monster. In this third American Tale sequel, rumors of a monster terrorizing mice in New York gets around, and Fivel begins having vivid nightmares of being attacked by it. So Fivel teams up with news reporter Nellie Bree to find out the facts. It turns out that the monster is actually a machine being operated by a gang of cats, led by a crazed poodle called Madame Mousset, who is currently posing as a fake psychic. I think the most valuable thing about this movie is its education on media culture for kids. It goes out of its way to explain why not everything in the news is true, because agency bosses tend to prioritize how many papers they can sell, but Nelly is a shining light in the exploitative media game. It's kind of cool seeing a reporter in a cartoon kids movie who isn't just a sleazebag out to make up a story. Nelly is someone who will work her butt off to make sure that she has correct details, the full context, and evidence to back herself up with. She's a fantastic role model for kids who want to become news reporters one day. That Manhattan monster is the biggest story in years. But not according to Nellie Bree. No, sir, she's off digging up dirt on politicians and bottles. Look here, I write about facts, not fairy tales. Now, the mystery of the monster itself isn't really a mystery because we work out the truth behind the monster quite early into the film. However, that's not really the point. The movie is more about Fivel fighting his imagination with facts by rationalizing what this monster could be. Nelly even supports him in this endeavor by reminding him that you can be scared and brave at the same time. They're not mutually exclusive feelings. You're fearless. Uh -huh. 
No, Five. Only fools are fearless. But I have to say the thing I love the most about this film is its terrific villain. Madame Musée is this deranged dog who's very insecure about her size for a canine. So she's trying to gain power and control over those smaller than her, mice. As she works with their very predators, cats, to rule over mouse society. There's little details to her character that give her texture as a villain. Like, her voice will switch between a posh French dialect and a tough New York accent at random, because she's struggling with her identity. She came from a glamorous house pet lifestyle, but wishes she could be seen as a wild street dog. No, no, I am not a rat! You got that? Not, 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 not! Okay, 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 okay! That's a good little mouse now. <laughs> Oh, and the closer we get to the finale, the more hostile and unpredictable she becomes, to the point where we no longer see her as this cartoony scamming poodle, but a legit threat to mouse kind. Mm, how's about Stark raving? <laughs> oh, and the fact Madame Hussein makes Fievel's family her prisoners turns this investigation into an even more personal adventure for Fievel, because he has to overcome his fears not only for himself, but also his parents and sisters' sake too. I honestly liked American Tale 4. Yes, there are better Don Bluth sequels out there, but considering how bad and boring these movies get, The Mystery of the Night Monster is an okay movie about fighting lies with facts, and how personal insecurity can turn someone into the real monster. The Land Before Time Free, the time of the Great Giving. When the Great Valley suddenly has a water shortage, the grown-ups decide to ration the water that's left, and Sarah's dad is being especially strict with drinking rights. Meanwhile, Littlefoot and friends try to find a new source of water, but also have to deal with a gang of bullies, led by the Nasty Hip. This is another Land Before Time sequel that I disliked on first watch, however, after revisiting it for this video, I actually better appreciate everything about it now, and feel guilty for being so unfairly harsh towards it in the past. The film mainly focuses on how the water shortage affects the Great Valley. This disaster isn't just background fodder, it's a chance for the parents to teach the kids about handling serious life-changing events. It's always important to help the kids adapt to societal changes, instead of acting like they're not happening, because children deserve to understand what's going on. Soon, everything will be as dry as that tree star. And it will be easier for fires to start. Fire? Yes, Littlefoot. Which is why you must remember the escape paths we've shown you. Sarah's dad is very straight when policing water rations, so much so that he refuses to let Littlefoot have a drink when he really needs it, which upsets Littlefoot's grandparents. We agreed that all herds must take turns drinking at the watering hole. Yes, we all agreed, but I didn't think that it included the children. It really isn't fair to them. Sarah's dad has always been someone who mistakes arrogant stubbornness for strength and intelligence. It's his biggest character flaw. Yes, the dinosaurs do need to be careful about how much water they drink, but that doesn't mean that they have to throw compassion out of the window, especially when a young child is very thirsty. You can be cautious and practical without being cold and unreasonable. While the adults are bickering and squabbling about the water rations, the kids are busy looking for a new water source despite being the newest victims of the local bullies. As much as we adults like to condescend the idea, kids can be more sensible and optimistic than grown-ups sometimes. What are we gonna do about the grown-ups, Littlefoot? They're acting like babies. I know. And it's all the Thundering Falls' fault, too. If we had more water, this wouldn't be happening. That's it, Sarah! What's it? Water! If we find some, the grown-ups will stop being mad. The adults are so focused on being right in their political debates that they stop paying attention to the kids. When adults put all of their energy into winning fights against each other, they can lose sight of who they're supposed to be protecting. I do remember complaining about how much the adult dinosaurs argued in this film, but you know what? In hindsight, I think that they argue as much as they need to. If the movie cut or toned down these fights, I think the point would have been missed. To be honest as well, there are much more annoying arguments in the other sequels. Once the adults stop bickering, they go look for the kids and find them outside the Great Valley. Sarah's dad, who has been shouting commands at his daughter the whole film in a desperate bid to keep her safe, sees Hip's father yelling at his kid in the same abusive way, and he comes to the epiphany that he's kind of been a bad dad. Yelling is no way to teach your child what is right or to show that you care. How would you know? I know because... Because I have a daughter, and I yell at her too much, especially when I'm worried for her safety. 
I love that Sarah's father learns his lesson about bad parenting all by himself. No one spells it out to him, and it's not up to Sarah to stand up to her dad. He sees a reflection of himself in Hip's dad, and learns a lesson on his own. It's a shame that Sarah's dad often went back to his old ways after this film, because this was a great character development. By the movie's end, the grown-ups stop all their fighting, restore the water supply, and work together to rebuild their community. Not only showing how civil compassion is the key to societal growth, but also teaching kids watching about the importance of sharing with others. It takes a very mature movie to work on two levels like that. To me, The Land Before Time 3 is one of the more superior Don Bluth sequels, a surprisingly profound film that explores how adults' behaviour can affect the children around them, and the constructive value of a community looking out for each other during a disaster. It's good morality fable sequels like this one that made me feel like we shouldn't paint all of these films with the same brush. An American Tale, The Treasure of Manhattan Island. Tony is working at a cheese factory with Fievel's dad, but the bosses are being very cruel. Tony and Fievel then find out that they've discovered a map to some Native American treasure in the subway tunnels. However, they learn that the Native American mice are still alive, and have been driven underground by industrial greed. Meanwhile, the cheese factory bosses are struggling to keep their power, so these crooked CEOs convince their employees to blame the Native Americans for their suffering. Fievel must defend his new friends from this angry mob, all while his dad tries to be a voice of reason. When I went into this film, I was expecting it to be a light-hearted treasure hunt adventure, but I soon realised that this is something far more complex and deeper than that. It's this very political protest movie that holds no bars with its commentary on America's dark side. The movie tackles such things as police brutality against the oppressed, how a lot of wealthy corporations overwork, silence, abuse, and underpay employees, all while they reap most of the benefits and dog whistle the masses into blaming minorities for their suffering. The movie goes in all hard for these themes too. There's no tiptoeing around the movie's mature topics. We're working ourselves to the bone while you're all getting fat. How about cutting us in? Actually, we're cutting you out! I this is like Russia all over again. I was really taken back by how this movie had the guts to inform kids about the worst aspects of US culture. Heck, even Fievel's mum drops a truth bomb about how immigrants feel about cops. What are police? They're these guys. They wear uniforms and they make sure everyone obeys the law. Th then they will help us. No. The Native Americans themselves are a huge improvement on the awful caricatures in Fievel Goes West. The movie not only sympathises with the Native American plight, but it also lets Fievel realise that his treasure hunt is no less better than his ancestors' crimes. We found this map and it told us about your treasure. That's why we came to grab it for ourselves. Just like Scuttlebutt. I told you this film doesn't tread around eggshells. Although I have seen folks criticise these Native American mice for having flawed stereotypes too. Like, their language is apparently totally made up. It's just gibberish made to sound like a tribal language to non-indigenous audiences. Manitou, Aki, Wamachus, Nolawi. What's he saying? He's calling upon the spirits of the earth to embrace you. Plus they have a habit of mainly talking in wise sayings when communicating with our heroes, which is a common overused cliche for Native American portrayals in Hollywood. You are like a chirping cricket. Sorry. Do not apologize. It is good to ask. Despite these issues, they're still a step up from Fievel Goes West. American Tale 3, When You Boil It Down, is one of many 90s movies about a guilt-ridden colonial character trying to protect natives from an oppressive force, but for a children's movie? Boy, does it go in hard and not hold back, all while sadly remaining very relevant to today's America. And before anyone complains that the franchise suddenly got woke, don't forget that the first movie was a social political commentary on working class struggles, immigration rights, and the harsh reality of the American dream. If anything, An American Tale 3 is the most faithful American Tale sequel. The Land Before Time 7, The Stone of Cold Fire. One night, Littlefoot sees a meteor landing nearby, which he names the Stone of Cold Fire. He's excited to tell everyone about it, but nobody believes him, except two new strangers, the Rainbow Faces, who insist that Littlefoot remains inquisitive about the meteor. Meanwhile, Petrie's uncle Tyranno, who was cast out of the herd for being a bad leader during the migration to the Great Valley, has returned to his family and uses Petrie to learn more about the meteor, which Toronto believes will make him so strong that the Great Valians will be convinced to re-elect him as a leader. When Ducky accidentally catches Toronto and two other Toronto Dons discussing plans, they resort to kidnapping the little dinosaur. While the adults desperately try to find a way to rescue Ducky, Ducky herself learns that Toronto is actually a sensitive soul who has gone down the wrong path, and not simply an evil villain 
with no compassion? Apparently, many Land Before Time fans consider this film to be the best sequel in the series. And you know what? I totally understand why. When I was slogging through these movies, Seven was a breath of fresh air, because it experiments with some different ideas than usual. A big appeal of the film is Toronto himself, a manipulative uncle who is made all the more fun by Michael York's flamboyant voice. I know how stubborn the other grown-ups can be. That's why I had to leave the herd, you know. They simply had no vision. Toronto isn't your straightforward kids movie villain because he's a baddie with a sense of remorse. He can be crooked and does bad things in the movie, but he has values in his heart. Despite being the film's antagonist, he actually hates any acts of violence, and he feels regret when his scheme puts Ducky in physical danger. Poor thing, so young, so full of life. So what? I was responsible for that little swimmer, and now I've lost her. He really wants power in the Great Valley, but he is genuinely passionate about being a great leader. The problem is that he's let everything go to his head. When he first failed as a leader, he was sincerely upset watching his herd get killed, and since then, he's wanted to prove that he can do better. Oh, I wanted to make everything perfect. I was going to create a paradise. But we already got paradise back in Great Valley. You no need to fix, just got to not break. The greyness of his morality is what makes him such a relatable character, because he's exactly what we can all become if we give in to our pride. Even the most good-natured and well-meaning of people can lose their way if they forget to be humble. I appreciate that the movie does punish Toronto by the end, too. A lot of films that write sympathetic villains forget that their antagonists did bad things, and we cut straight to a happy ending for them. Land Before Time 7, though, gives a severe but fitting comeuppance to Toronto's crimes and it's moving how he finally lets go of his pride and accepts the consequences to his actions. Oh, let him stay. He very sorry. That may be, but it doesn't change what he did, and he must be responsible for that. Petrie! But... She's right. We must all be accountable for our actions. The Rainbow Faces, meanwhile, are a very strange pair, and we spend a lot of the film trying to put a pin on them, but it's their enigmatic nature that makes them fascinating to follow. Plus, their passion for intrigue and science rubs off on our heroes, making the film's adventure brilliantly educational for Littlefoot and his friends. Very perceptive. And whenever the smoking mountain heats up, the water, uh, bubbles and shoots up the shaft, now, if there was something solid between you and the hot water... It would push us right to the top! Mm -hmm. By the movie's end, we learn that the Rainbow Faces are, in fact, space aliens. No, really. What's even weirder is that this isn't a jumping of the shark. This twist makes complete sense in hindsight. Their advanced knowledge of science, their reluctance to explain who they are or where they came from, it all totally adds up. I really love that these aliens came to prehistoric Earth to spark intellectual curiosity into dinosaurs. It's a really sweet gesture when you think about it. Land Before Time 7 is a refreshingly existential look into the franchise's universe, a film that uses the arrival of a meteor to examine the complicated shades of morality and the mystery of the unknown, as well as the importance of questioning everything, whether that be the true character of a family outcast, or the science behind a new discovery. All Dogs Go to Heaven 2 Charlie and Carface are now living in heaven together. Carface has been such a good boy that Annabelle rewards him with a medal. But little does she know that Carface is secretly working with a cat devil called Red. While Charlie greets Itchy at the gates of heaven, Carface steals the powerful Gabriel's horn, which can open the gates of Dog Heaven, and escapes back to Earth, only to end up dropping the horn along the way. Annabelle asks Charlie and Itchy to go collect Gabriel's horn. However, Charlie gets distracted after he falls for a dog called Sasha, but it turns out that mortals can't see angels. Carface then reveals that he can be seen by mortals, because he's wearing a magic collar. Charlie meets Carface's mysterious friend, who is actually red in disguise, and gets magic collars for himself and Itchy. Charlie then follows Sasha, only to realise that she's been looking after a runaway child called David, who has a talent for magic. Sasha can't convince David to go home, so Charlie agrees to make sure that the kid is safe on the streets, all while Itchy insists that they find Gabriel's horn. Luckily, with David and Sasha's help, they do retrieve Gabriel's horn from a police station. However, Charlie and Itchy's magic collars suddenly lose their power, so Charlie tells Red that he'll trade Gabriel's horn for a new magic collar. Red breaks out of his disguise and reveals that this second magic collar gives him control over Charlie. Not only that, Carface has kidnapped David and will only return the boy once Charlie brings Gabriel's horn to Red. Okay, I'm gonna say it. <sighs> I think that this sequel is better than the original. 
What did you say? Yes, after re-watching both films for this video, not only have I become a sincere All Dogs 2 fan, but I also think it's the only film on this list that's genuinely superior to its predecessor. Don't get me wrong, All Dogs 1 has that distinct Don Bluth charm, some very memorable scenes, the cutest little girl character ever, and its own little sweet moments. But a part of me likes it less after my latest rewatch. I used to praise it for its odd weirdness and dark edge, but you know what? I now think those things are its flaws. It's so strange that it can border on random, and it's so dark that it's often too mean-spirited and cruel. All Dogs Go to Heaven 2 tweaks those problems, by giving us a movie that doesn't let its weirdness turn into pure chaos, and channels all of its dark side into the evil antagonist. First of all, I think it's lovely seeing Charlie actually helping a child in need this time, and not wanting anything in return from them. Sure, Sasha is what motivates Charlie to pay attention to David at first, but as the movie goes on, Charlie takes a real shine to David, and ends up earnestly caring about making David's street life safe and happy. Heck, even the anxiety-ridden Itchy finds a friend in David. Most of this film is about an unlikely family sticking together, all for the love of this adorable runaway kid with a great sense of humour and fantastic magician skills. Nothing on my sleeve, sir. What? Officer, what's that behind your ear? Thank you, thank you. You've been a great audience. David ran away from home because he's upset about having a new stepmom. Now, sure, it's safe for David to go home any time, but keep in mind, some children can find new changes in their home too overwhelming, and it's up to Charlie to help the boy process these emotions. My stepmom doesn't want me. She's having her own kid. But parents can love more than one pup. Maybe she just didn't know how to tell you that. Maybe you should give her another chance. You know, I ran away from home when I was little. Did that make your parents sorry? I don't know. I never saw him after that. Guess I could have used a guardian angel, huh? The stakes in All Dogs 2 are fantastic as well, because Charlie's divided between protecting David and his responsibility as an angel. Sure, he naively makes mistakes when trying to balance both, but he always takes accountability for the consequences and never leaves an accident or sacrifice hanging. Charles, what have you done? Charlie, we gotta do something! No, Itch, it's my fault. I'm the one who's gotta do something. Get David home safely. The villain, Rant, is very intimidating and menacing, but not too scary for kids. He'll sing a goofy musical number about loving being evil one second, but then he'll eat a live rat right in front of our eyes the next. I think he's the right balance of creepy and fun. Three cheers for treachery! It feels so good to be bad! As an antagonist, he's surprisingly devious and clever for such a loud and bad-tempered character. He knows exactly how to make his villain disguise convincing, going as far as to pretend to not care about the horn, Plus, he's very patient about letting his scheme take its time to pay off. Despite being larger than life and personality, this guy has mastered nuance. Yeah, and sure. What's the catch, old man? No catch. Any friend of Carface is a friend of mine. There's something quite disturbing about his evil plan, too. He wants to use Gabriel's horn to suck all the residents of Doggy Heaven into the rusty cells of Alcatraz, a real American abandoned prison. He's using this celestial instrument from the innocent clouds of heaven and turning it into an evil weapon against sweet little pup angels. Honestly, this is maybe the best Don Blue sequel villain. <laughs> There's more I could say about this movie, but I think I've gone on for too long. So maybe I'll do a new video on it one day. Emphasis on maybe. But All Dogs Go to Heaven 2 really won me over on a second viewing. This is why I think it's unfair to dismiss the very idea of a Don Bluth sequel. Because no matter how much we love the originals, they have their flaws and the sequels can improve on them. Bartok the Magnificent. In this spin-off to Anastasia, Bartok the Bat is teamed up with a posh voice bear called Zozi, and they make a living doing a street performance that stages Bartok as a magnificent hero. Prince Ivan happens to be watching their act, and rewards them with a shiny royal ring, which offends Ivan's uptight advisor, Ludmilla. The following night, the prince is kidnapped by the scary witch Baba Yaga, so Ludmilla asks Bartok to go rescue his majesty from the witch. The bat is reluctant at first, but is convinced to do the right thing. Bartok and Zuzi head to Barbara's lair. The witch says that she'll return Prince Ivan if the bat does a series of special tasks for her, but he's not allowed to be helped by Zuzi in any of them. Now, I know some people might get nitpicky about whether this film counts, because it's technically a prequel, and it has the advantage of being co-directed by Don Bluth himself. But it feels very silly to ignore Bartok the Magnificent when discussing the legacy of Don Bluth spin-off movies. 
After watching every single Don Bluth sequel that's ever been made, I've come to better appreciate Bartok the Magnificent. Sure, it's nothing spectacular in the grand scheme of animation cinema, but it has so much more charm and personality than all the sequels that Don Bluth had nothing to do with. Yeah, it's rather short for a feature film, which means that every task Bartok has given is completed quite fast, but all the fun comes from seeing how Bartok overcomes his small size and relies on clever strategies to outweigh Baba Yaga's obstacles, showing that intelligent wit can be just as effective as muscle-bound brawn. <laughs> For a protagonist, Bartok is quite a chatty little fella, but his chipper talkativeness has grown on me, and it's his sarcastic quips or anxious remarks that carry a lot of the scenes in the film, with every line being made even cuter and funnier by his actor Hank Azarian. I assure you, uh, you will be handsomely rewarded. <laughs> no, no, really, I... Well, perhaps I could push the Hydra at the Jew. <coughs> I, I, I mean, no, I, I really, I can't. Hydra, terrible. Eight heads, flailing about, eating people, it's it's not pretty. The movie has a lot of memorable side characters too. Zozi, the refined and cultured bear who always believes in Bartok. A possible hero in you. Me? Yes, you. Peel off the ditzy magical creature who's always happy. <laughs> My goodness, you are determined. I love that. <sighs> This whole thing is very exciting. And Tim Curry's charismatic riddle challenging school door. Me, me, me. <clears throat> no matter how hard you hit me, no matter how much I hurt, oh. I'm always good for a laugh. What am I? Hmm. A funny bone. This is also the best animated Don Bluth sequel, which to be fair is unsurprising when Bluth himself directed it. Even though the movie has a straight-to-video budget, Bluth's distinct fluid line work, attention to detail, and renowned perfectionism shine through every frame. Even the primitive 90s CGI effects work, because they totally fit an overworldly fairy tale setting. We also get a big twist towards the end of the movie, when it's revealed that Ludmilla ordered a minion Vol to kidnap Prince Ivan in a Baba Yaga disguise and locked his majesty in a tower so that she could steal the throne. That's right, Baba Yaga turns out to be innocent, and all of Bartok's tasks had a deeper purpose. Baba was actually getting Bartok to collect ingredients for a special potion that brings a person's inner self to the outside, and each task was a test to see if Bartok could use that potion for good. All along, Baba Yaga, despite her bitter reputation, was actually playing her part in saving Russia's prince, all while teaching Bartok to realize that he could be a real hero instead of a con hero. Wait a minute, you mean the whole time I was doing all that stuff for me? Mm-hmm. Now leave me and save the prince! The twist that the glamorous Lord Miller is the cruel villain who masterminded a treason, and the old wrinkled Baba Yaga is a good witch who just happens to be kind of cranky and dark humored, helps to teach kids to not judge a person by their appearance, but by their true colors. A sentiment that's punctuated by the potion, which is eventually used by Lord Miller, revealing her inner self to be the very monster that she painted Baba Yaga out to be. <laughs> Bartok the Magnificent is testament to how only Don Bluth can make the best Don Bluth sequel, because his personal touch is what gives this film its endearing appeal and rewatchability. Unlike other every sequel I watched for this video, Bartok the Magnificent gave me that special whimsical feeling that only a good Don Bluth film can, and that is why it's earned my number one spot. So those are my rankings. What is your favourite Don Bluth sequel? Let everyone know in the comments section below, and don't forget to click that like button. I think the biggest takeaway I got from watching all these films is that we should be more open-minded about them. Yeah, some of them are bad, really bad, but there's a few gems in there and even the average ones have some positives. I've been Jambariki, cheerio folks.